Hello everyone, I'm Alex Elmore and this is the Who Knew Sports Podcast. So today we went across the pond, 6 a.m. early in the morning, and we interviewed Jeff Wilson. He is a sports strategist and a marketing consultant for different uh, football organizations mainly. Uh, he does a lot of, he does a few other sports, but his big thing is uh, football. He does a lot for the United Kingdom. He also travels to different countries as you'll hear about. Uh, one of them being Rwanda, and uh, he just tries to build organizations from the ground up and teach them kind of how to um, market yourself, market your organization, market what you do, and try to get fans into the building. So please watch, please listen, and you will enjoy this. I guarantee it. This is a great interview. So thank you for watching, and see ya. See you. All right, Jeff. Uh, I know we just said it, but how are you? <laughs> you can hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. That's great. That's great. How how did you find the other the other session that we did? Was it was it useful? Oh yeah, I actually uh, really enjoyed it. Uh just you know, a lot of the different technology you got went over. It was really cool. Brilliant. Brilliant. Delighted to hear that. Delighted yeah. to hear that. So uh I did have, you know, a few more questions kind of off of that, some things I noticed on your, uh, I guess, LinkedIn. So um, you do a lot of, like, I guess, consulting. Is that the majority of what you do? Yeah. So what, what, what I would do, a couple of things. Uh, number one is consultancy. So working with some of the biggest sports organizations in the world. Now, what does that mean? Well, in essence, strategic planning, uh, marketing, communications, um, governance, uh, capacity building. So a whole range of areas in that sort of consultancy. And then the second area that I really focus in is on the area of, well, uh, knowledge exchange and, and, and lecturing. So lecturing in sport, uh, conducting um, workshops and conferences and webinars. So it's really in those two areas, but all within the, the sports sphere. Okay, so at the uh, workshops and webinars, what are some of the things that you kind of talk about? So again, uh, I've actually just launched a, a new one on strategic planning. Mm. So uh, it's a 90 minute course on what you can do within, uh, within well, in essence, strategic planning, vision, mission, goals, objective. Uh, I've done one with the Barcelona Innovation Hub. That's part of Barcelona Football Club mm. on digital marketing in sport. Um, but wider areas would uncover things such as governance, uh, income generation, brand building, digital, uh, developing a plan for uh, clubs or federations. So it's quite quite wide, and I think that's quite important to have a like you know a wide, not just focused on one area such as digital. Yeah. So are you? You talk about you know building your own like kind of organization or a new organization. What are some like, you know, tips to you give to people about like, you know, trying to build their uh, new sports uh, organization? Yeah, um, great, great question. I think for me, first of all, it's got to start with experience. Mm -hmm. So working in a sports organization or an agency or on the sponsorship side really gets you an insight into the industry. So in my case, it was with the Irish Football Association here in Belfast. So understanding how an association works, how football is being developed and rolled out, how the national team like US soccer uh, would be represented by their association. So I think that experience is uh, important as a, as a starter for 10. I think after that, then you're reading lots uh, of, of information, keeping up to date. And I think number three is learning from other people, other consultants, other um, uh, people that you sort of um, in your sphere of influence mm. that you can learn from them and, and take some very interesting, you know, uh, models or approaches. So in essence, when you do that, your own experience, you look at other people's, you know, sort of thoughts and, and sight and those elements start to then pull together your way of doing things. And I think the second, the, the last thing I would say is 
when you can create it in a model, then gives you a set direction. So I've created three models in sport, growing attendance, fan engagement, and uh, sports data maturity. And they're all being created because of that experience, talking to other people, doing lots of reading. And then these models are now being adopted and used by lots of different sports. Uh, and it's a good way to, you know, to go through, I think, uh, whenever you're being a consultant, having that model uh, and that way and rely on that experience. Uh, yeah, so you talked about attendance and I'm kind of wondering, you know, what's the best, uh, what's the way to grow, what's the best way to grow attendance for like, you know, smaller market teams? Yeah, great question. I mean, for me, a lot has to be around two broad, or, sorry, well, I'll say three. One is the marketing. Mm -hmm. You've got to tell people, when your game is on so that whole marketing bit and that has got to be better so it can't just be on social media it's got to be on every aspect so people know regularly when your game is on so i think that that to me is really really important number two is deep community engagement mm. and i don't mean just going out and saying hello to a community organization i mean them knowing you and you knowing them really really deep deep relationships building those uh connections and i think number three is having a great experience so whether you're you know at the 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 event uh the quality of the hamburgers mm. uh is the seat dirty um you know getting into you know queue is a queue so long to get in to get your ticket so i think these are there are many others but for me, these are these are key areas: marketing, promotion, the the whole experience at the actual event, deep community, and suppose I would put one right across all of those three, and that's people having someone who is welcoming, open, and have that sort of way, mm -hmm. you know, to bring people to pe people in, people deal with people. So you probably know a lot about. Uh... English football over there, correct? Yep. And you kind of know how about that, all of that system works. I'm, I'm not too familiar with it, but I know kind of like each town or city kind of has like at least one soccer team, right? Yeah, but you know, uh, rugby, uh, football, field hockey um, are all big sports here. And we would call them nearly like big traditional sports. And, and many of these would have community-based, so community-based community, community -based football or, or soccer club. Mm. And then the more you go up the leagues, the more then that would be. So it's not the same franchise model as the MLS. It is basically a promotion and relegation. Yeah. If you win your league, you go up. Uh, you win that league, you go up and so on and so forth. But there will always be the, the, the masses and that community just playing for fun as an adult. So let me give you an example. I was with an African country doing um, three weeks ago, doing a strategic plan. They had 12 million people and wow. 60, 60 clubs, six zero. Oh, wow. In Northern Ireland, so that's where I'm from, we have 1.8 million. Okay, so 1.8 million people compared to 12 million. 60 clubs in this African country, and ours is around 900 clubs. Oh my God. So that is where the, where the tradition has always been. So we get, get a 60 to 12 million, 900 to 1.8 million. And that is... That is why, and it's all, a lot of it is community-based with still promotion and relegation. There still is that sort of, let's say, the, the triangle, you know, so you a very wide base, and then you've got a small number of elite people at the top, clubs. And that is why Europe is so unique in what we do is because a lot of this community-type activity. Yeah, I, you know, you don't really get that in the U.S. It's, it's a little bit different. It's more... It's not, it's not much, it, it is community, but it's not as, it's not like community-based like you guys. 
Yeah, I think one thing that you do really well, mm. really well, is the school and the colleges. Yes. So, so our school and college sport is important, but it's not as important as the clubs. Where, like, so our university, where you've got a university sport coming to watch sport in our university, there's this amount of people. Mm-hmm. Where you watch a sport in your college or high school, there's this amount of people. Oh yeah. And that's, so so there's just a difference in that um, in that side, and I think you've got more academies, and the academies are, are quite commercial academies in yes. football, where our academies are part of the club. Uh, so each club would have senior. U U twenty one, U eighteen, seventeen, sixteen, da, 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 right down to mm. U six. Yeah, our academies I think are mostly football and uh, basketball. If I'm yeah. not mistaken. So, um, you know, you've done you've done a lot of like marketing and consulting. Well, you've gotten to this consulting part of your career. What were you before consulting? So before that, I I was um, about eight years in a telecom company called British Telecom, which is similar to your AT and T. Okay. And th- th- that's important to note because not because of me, but because of BT, I got lots of training, lots of corporate models and corporate way of doing business. Mm-hmm. Then I moved into the Irish Football Association. Uh, for 10 years and what I did I brought the learnings from the corporate world and brought them into the football or or, or the sports world so that's everything from email databases to well we were doing social media probably now 16 17 years ago Mm -hmm. we were doing live streaming 16 17 years ago the numbers were small but we were still doing that. So we were bringing a lot of the corporate thinking into the sports environment. Um, but I was 10 years at, at the Irish Football Association. And again, brilliant organization and, and got lots of learnings in other areas of marketing, such as sponsorship, merchandising, mm. et cetera, et cetera. But the basic principles are the same in terms of strategy, governance, marketing, communications, the principles are the same. The industry just will change different, maybe platforms, more event based, as an example. But um, no, it's it's a great industry to be in, uh, and I'm very fortunate with the career progression. And again, not because of me, but because of that experience that you right. end up getting. So, what was live streaming and social media like 16 years ago? Yeah, I mean, uh, to be straight, we had 30 people. That was what we were averaging. Oh, wow. Um, and so it was little to no, nobody. Um, we did it through a provider that we were that we were doing. Most of it came from outside of Northern Ireland, people who from Northern Ireland, but living in America, as an example. Um, obviously, the, the, the broadband was uh, very, let's say, uh, maybe not reliable <laughs> um, or the rollout. So it wasn't just as, as a great a product than what it is now. And I think in fairness, we were doing a lot of testing for different partners and we were happy to be that test. Uh, Let me give you another example. Maybe 15 years ago, we integrated our online shop into Facebook. Mm -hmm. 15 years ago, I'm not sure many people were doing that and we got one sale. So it didn't work, but what do you hear people talking about now? Selling on social. That's so, so you guys were kind of like one of the first people to kind of test it. I, I honestly don't know, uh, to be honest. Uh. I couldn't say yes or no, but what I could tell you is that we were doing this 15 years ago and it did not work, you know, but I don't mind because there was other things that did work. We had our email database. We, we did lots of content on social media. Um, we did lots on brand building. We did lots on strategic planning. So loads of really great things and fan engagement that we did. Um, but there were certain things that just didn't. And you know what? You just put the hand up and say, okay, wasn't right for the time, the way it is, for example, yeah. now. But I do would say to people, be innovative and be creative. Yeah. 
did you so like did you completely stop with the streaming and social media or did it you kind of just let it sit there or what was kind of well we weren't too bad because what we did on the, the the streaming we did it through a partner and the partner was learning for for their other partners as well so they were happy for it to continue and because it was the international game like for example the us uh, women's soccer team as an example you weren't playing every week the way for example arsenal or liverpool were doing so this was it was international football so the, the amount of games were maybe well 12 to 15 a year. So it, it worked in okay for them. They were able to test it. And we were able to see, uh, you know, that that creativity that we, that, that was important to us. That, yeah. So that's really uh, kind of cool. So like you, you've worked with, you know, technology, your kind of like your entire career, career and watch it kind of grow. And you kind of talked about this in, in our class. Um, what, can you talk a little bit more about uh, some of the newer technology that you work with today? Yeah, so, uh, you know, technology, I think, has been accelerated with mm -hmm. the pandemic. Uh, it was always going to happen, but it's just been accelerated. Right. And I think there's a range of things. I think number one is e-learning. Whether that is coach education or people learning on the business side, there's more e-learning in that way of learning. But... I think in general, there are areas such as esports, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, live streaming, online betting. Uh, I think crypto and cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, um, all of these things are becoming, and NFTs is another one, are all becoming uh, interesting and new technologies. Um, okay, some like live streaming aren't maybe just as new, but what we're doing with them now, we're now making them better and better and better and better. What do I mean by that? Let's say online buying uh, a piece of merchandising online. The process and the customer service that comes with buying online is getting better. Mm -hmm. Buying a ticket online, the process is getting better. And also there are cashless payments, cashless uh, mm -hmm. ticketing that's happening. So I think the, the original digital, so for example, uh, online ticketing, online merchandising is always there. It's just getting better. I'm not right. into social, but I do think there's a real drive in augmented reality, virtual reality, NFTs, online betting, more um, interactivity on live streaming and adding more to these technologies to make them more interactive community and engaging. Yeah, so you you kind of showed us a video of the um, virtual reality of how you could just be in the stadium at uh, at your home. And first of all, that was really cool. Second of all, how how close are you guys to, or how close do you, how close are you guys to being like really um, trying to figure out what I want to ask here? How close are you guys being? Um, to perfecting that i guess not maybe perfecting is the wrong word but how close yeah. are you guys to getting it really good <laughs> yeah i think we're still a little bit away i think um with facebook's recent uh, announcement of the metaverse oh yeah um I, I think you know trying to get people into that digital space will probably drive that forward but i think there's a couple of things i think number one um producing uh, virtual uh, reality content is still you know can be still expensive and um, that needs to come down in terms of production costs i think number two the actual glasses and getting the cost of those down and more wide you know spread awareness is also another one and then i think the actual quality of the actual content the clarity of the content which is getting better again still needs to improve and then i think that, that the fourth area is where there's more data feeds coming into that live, if it's a live stream on a uh, virtual reality, that there's more data feeds that come in. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're watching a live football or soccer game, uh, and I can just say, okay, Alex, Alex scored a goal. I can go on and say, right, what is Alex's, um, what's his, uh, uh, how long has he run during the game? 
what has been his top feed, what, how many goals did he score in his last five games. Let me see the clips of what those games are and what goals he scored. All of that data and making that more interactive, I think, is probably where there needs to be a lot more development on. Yeah, so during that video, you kind of had, like, uh, player tracking on the uh, players. Um, so is that – was that – in that video, is that – some was that, like, an actual, like, an example, or was that kind of something that they kind of edited in there, or how did that work? No, that, that, all that is doable and possible. So you have different technologies like GPS. Mm. Uh, you've got other technologies that literally can have a chip and you can see it on American football. It's on sometimes the pads. Okay. Uh, in football, it's like a little vest where you've got a chip on the back. And that chip with, uh, in essence, Wi-Fi antennas around the stadium can actually gauge how fast you're running, uh, how far you're running, and a whole range of other important metrics, not only to improve the person, but also to make sure that they're not overworked in terms of potential injuries. Oh, so this is also kind of useful for like coaches, right? Very useful for mm. coaches. You know, one, like in essence, it's probably is meant for coaches initially. Mm. Now, because of some of the data, and then that becomes interesting for fans. Now, you go into another interesting space of who owns the data and then data protection mm. uh, and then who commercialized that data. So that's a, a, another another for a, a, another topic for another day. Mm -hmm. But um, it really is for the coaches to try and improve that person by one two percent because they're already at the elite end. So how can they improve them by that extra one or two percent, and then uh, widening out the fans thereafter? But majority would be for a performance related usage. So yeah, I all of that is pretty cool um just i i really hope like it would you know i i guess the medical stuff would also would also have access to this information as well to kind of go and tell the coaches correct yeah and that could be for example you know uh, sleep you can even bring in their sleep you know so uh, <laughs> measuring you know how many hours somebody sleeps or are they just you know did they get woke up during the night on their sleep? Therefore, they're not, you know, totally rested right the way through to, um, as I say, you know, the likes of the the, the, the chip during um, uh, training or during a game. What are they actually doing? Are they running as hard and as much as what they've done in the past? Their average. So loads and loads of different metrics. Um, I think if I'm being honest with you, that's an interesting area for someone starting out in sport. Mm. That area of being able to have insight, but meaningful insight, and to be able to analyze the data, because we're going to have so much data on fans, mm. so much data on players and other stakeholders. How, how do you make meaningful analysis mean, that allows you to, to do something on the back of it? So to analyze massive amounts of data and making it then business-wise meaningful, I think will be a very interesting skill. So you're kind of thinking like, you know, we have stat people for, you know, the specific, um, what happens on the field. Do you think there's going to be stat people that also deal with like, you know, people's sleep schedule and trying to figure out? Yeah. I think there definitely will be a lot on off the field type activities. Mm -hmm. So if I go to a stadium, uh, you know, how many hamburgers do I need to order based on what I know people consume during that, that, that game? And then, you know, how many red sauces do I need to order? Because I don't want to order too much, uh, but I want to use the data to be able to, you know, get the right amount ordered and, and therefore save costings in terms of stock. So... I think that will be one. I think Wi-Fi usage and what people, when they log on their Wi-Fi, what they do on the Wi-Fi, then how to personalize that data mm -hmm. so that it can say, hi, Jeff, your hamburger is actually around the corner with red sauce and no lettuce because I know you don't like lettuce. And it's personalized messages, you know, to me and using that data to personalize, but to be able to push something relevant 
based on, on on that amount of data about me. So you actually, you did also touch on this. You think in the, if I remember this correctly, you think in the future there will be like a chip in your shoulder that kind of like um, tells people what you want just by, you know, just scanning it. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I believe whether it's on the head or in the arm, you will have a, a chip that will be inserted uh, into us. That chip will do away with the need for having uh, credit cards, cash, et cetera, et cetera. And that will allow you to be your passport to get you to a country, your ticket to get into, um, you know, through the turnstile. It will be able through Beacon Technology, say, okay, Jeff, and send you a personalized message. It will be able to manage your health and be able to say when we score a goal, mm -hmm. what basically, what your heart rate is. And you'll be able to buy your hamburger, you name it all there. That's personalized to you, but highly, highly personalized. Why? Because of the 5G devices, the more that will be, will be all connected to you and be using your, in essence, um, what you're doing during a game and et cetera, et cetera, for personalized activity. And people ask me, well, how, how do I know that will happen? Well, I think number one, we, we did a barter system years and years and years ago. Then we had cash. Cash has now moved to credit cards, and it now makes sense going to the next level. It also is happening in animals. You go to a dog and you can bleep and the, the chip is under the, rather than a collar. Normally when it goes into animals, it's always a good sign that that then is going to come to humans. Right. Um, I'm starting to see it in certain commercial areas where the chip has come in that allows people to get in through the door of their work in their factory. So to me, I've been talking about it now for maybe five years. And, and I really do see that happening. Uh, not only that, but the whole area of more data and personalized data with a personalized message directly to you based on that data. So you, you're saying people have already started to kind of get the chip, right? In certain outside of sport now, uh, uh. In, in a number of different countries, uh, getting into a factory, uh, you know, as part of security. And, uh, you know, so those things are already there. And, like you can get a key fob obviously on your key that gets you in, but your key fob can be lost. It can be stolen. Right. Well, you can't do it if it's under your, under your skin. Hmm. Interesting. I didn't know like people were already kind of getting chips yep. for just getting into their work. So very I actually, few, very, very few now, but there is one or two businesses that started to do that. But very and, few. And like, are the people like, very willing to get this chip? Well, I think what will probably happen is, um, I, I, and I do believe this, uh, it's like the same cultural change from cash to credit card. Probably a lot of people don't have cash now. It's all on credit card or on the phone. Right. So it's a cultural change. So over time, things like this will become culturally accepted. Yeah. I just, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. So I kind of going back, kind of going away from the chip thing, because I, I wrote a note down about the e-learning thing that you talked about. So with COVID, have you seen this technology kind of uh, improving with e-learning? Absolutely. If somebody would have said to me five years ago, Jeff, we're going to do online e-learning courses, I would have went, no, I want to do face-to-face. -face. No, no, I'd rather do face-to-face. -face. <laughs> and, and, and I have been totally gobsmacked. And I think one of those bits has been, again, the pandemic, but also the younger people, the Gen Zers, they're used to digital first. Yeah. So e-learning on digital first is, that's the way it's always been. Right. So you've got the pandemic and you've got the Gen Zers. So again, cultural team, they're used to that. And you've got the pandemic that's accelerated it. And I'm seeing now a lot more people um, uh, doing training on either, either online live, like here, or recorded, recorded video with templates of people to follow. Uh, and as I say, I, so I created two, one with Barcelona Football Club on digital marketing and sport, and the one uh, for myself on strategic planning 
which is a 90 minute course, just 30 US dollars. Uh, I never would have done that five years ago. Yet so, now, uh, I see, I see the, 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 the growth in that area. So what do you prefer, online or in person? I'm old. So okay. for, me, for me, I prefer in person because you can see people, but you can create the atmosphere. You can, you know, um, go off soundboard off people a lot more easy because if it's a live online session, you can turn the video off and just go and do something. Right. Um, and a much learning is deep in that case. Uh, at coffee breaks, you can network a lot better. Yes, I know you can do Zoom rooms, but networking and learning from each other in group work face to face is also an important part of learning rather than just listening to the lecture. Yeah, I, I kind of, uh, in a way, I agree with it. I do think these uh, Zoom kind of live virtual lectures, they are nice, they're convenient. Yeah. But I do, I do, I do, in a way, miss the classroom. There were some certain aspects to it that I uh, really appreciated. And I, I think I would like to go back maybe one day, maybe. We'll see. I think next next year I do have an in-person class. I, I think so. I'm, I'm going to make a real general sweeping statement. But, you know, as human beings, we're made to be with people. Mm -hmm. Social creatures. We're, we're social creatures. Right. Okay, I understand there's one or two people in the room. Hmm. but in the main we're social creatures and if you just said right we're going to switch off all the computers switch off everything and I'm not going to talk to anybody for two years your head will be in hmm. we're social people that's why to me face to face is important let alone that networking sharing getting to know people in a deeper way right so have you seen like have you been starting to get out there more outside and starting to talk to people live, I guess? Yep. So in the last, uh, let's say, six, seven weeks, I've been to Gambia, I've been to Ethiopia, oh, I've been nice. to Rwanda. Um, I'm going next week to Switzerland um, and have another one or two coming up before Christmas. So it's definitely starting back. Um, and what I'm seeing is a bit of a hybrid model we do a little bit online and then face to face a little bit online face to face. it seems to be that seems to be a, a way that people are um looking at what rather than just solely online or solely face to face yeah i definitely have really uh, appreciated more of the app like kind of the option side of to it where you kind of get both so what was it what was it like, kind of like your first time back out in the field, I guess? Well, um, <laughs> so for me, so um, Ethiopia was country number 87 that I've been to. Oh, yeah. So 87 individual separate countries doing what I do. Um, and the pandemic was good for me because it put a hold on being away so much. So it was great to be with the family. Mm -hmm. That social bit that we're talking about, social creatures. Um, but it is nice to go out and see different cultures. Um, it's nice to see their culture, but also to be able to see that you're helping them. Right. So you're leaving something of a legacy uh, as well as seeing their culture, but it also appreciate you more of your own culture and how great your own culture is. Mm. But uh, yes, it was a wee bit, uh, oh, where do I park the car? How, you know, what forms do they need to fill in to get yeah. onto the plane? And, so it was a little, a little bit different with the COVID restrictions, but for me personally, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. That's great to hear. So like when you go to Rwanda, is there, I guess, is it for soccer, soccer marketing? Yep. Yeah. Yep. How, I guess, I guess that's more of a smaller market kind of. Well, to be honest with you in Africa, um, it's between football and basketball would okay. be the, the, the big sports um, and in a lot of countries participation is maybe different than what's elite so um, I'm going to say something really, I, I'm going to probably be wrong here but I'll, I'll go with it okay. uh, if you take the NFL and the, the NHL so American football and ice hockey 
they are probably really well seen. Loads of people go to the games, loads of people want to watch the games, but they're probably not the biggest in terms of participation. People okay. playing for fun. So the ones playing for fun will be probably, I would have thought, basketball and what I hear, football as well, soccer. So, yeah. you know, there's more people would play that participation, physically participation, yet lots of people maybe don't participate, but they would view and watch these big, big sports and great sports. But, so what I'm trying to say is sometimes when you actually look at the numbers, you realise, huh, never thought the participation would be so low when so many people watch these yeah. games on ESPN or whatever. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, we also, we've been talking about youth sports in our class, and, you know, the biggest youth sports are probably, like, soccer and baseball. Uh, football, kind of, it, it's definitely there, but I don't know if it's as big as soccer is youth sports-wise. And the reason is, is it, it's, it's cost. Like, at the end of the day, it is literally, like, soccer and basketball are not that expensive yeah. compared to, like, football and hockey is really expensive because, you know, stick breaks, that's $200. Yeah. And that's really what it comes down to. So is that kind of like, you know, when you're in Rwanda, is that kind of like you're not seeing a lot of youth sport thing, uh, youth sport organizations there? Is that kind of what it is? Well, what – each country is different, but mm. you normally will do, you, you, you will start off with the federation and see where the federation is looking to go. Then you talk and, and meet with the clubs who are members of the federation. And where you want to try and get to is that there's loads of clubs, male, female, but each club has got a pathway in place. So from U6 right up to senior. And there's always people staying within the, that club environment. Yes, people will go from club to club depending on where they're at in a league, but the strength in the clubs, both on the pitch and off the pitch, the strength in coach education, the strength in refereeing, um, the strength in uh, schools football, uh, the strength in community football, to use football for health and social tackling issues, uh, and then the national team in terms of fan engagement, income generation, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, very, very wide. But each one will be something that you'll say, ah, you need to fix this. So let's focus on that area as an example. Okay. Um, so what is some of the, uh, what are your probably the biggest issues that you see within the, like, you know, you talk about those issues that, small issues that people need to fix. What are some of the more common ones? Yeah, common ones for me is all in the area of club and club development. Mm -hmm. So developing clubs, having the right people work in the clubs from a volunteer point of view, especially right the way through to on the pitch, uh, sort of all the different elite levels in place from youth right the way to senior level. Um, so club development, I would say, is one big one. Number two, governance. Um, and number three, income generation. Um they would probably be three biggies. Uh, and uh, I might put in their coach education and, and coaching development. So those would be sort of four biggies. Club development, um, income generation, governance, a little bit of coach education, and a little bit on competition. That's another one, competition mm. development as well. So, Jeff, I have one more question for you. And that is, what is some of the bigger... Um, what are some of the best tips or uh, kind of what is kind of the best way to grow into what you do or how do you get into the sports marketing business best ways? Okay. So um, great question. Boy, well, you're on fire with these questions. Well, mm. well, brilliant questions. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. So for me, I think uh, when, when you're studying, I think, uh, let me try and take it from that level. When you're studying, one of the things that you've got to do is, yes, do a qualification that is similar or something in sport. I did one in marketing, so it was similar, or a sports management degree. That gets you a basis of knowledge. You, you need to have your, your, your education in place. Number two, volunteer. On that note, I do. I'm actually am minoring in digital marketing communications. 
Good man. Yeah. Good man. Good man. And, and that is so important because the likes of marketing, digital marketing, um, financial management, all them are as, if not even more important when it comes into the sports environment. So those you can go into any industry. So those type of courses and sports management courses. So do them. Next, volunteer. Go and volunteer for your local um, a franchise. Um, even if that means getting something for free, build up your your, your mm -hmm. experience, build up your knowledge, uh, build up your um, your networking. And then I think what happened with me is the job came up at the Irish Football Association to keep an eye out for jobs in sport. But when I went to interview it, it wasn't Jeff Wilson who got it. It was because I had all of that experience in the corporate world in strategy, marketing, communications, digital, I had already that experience. So I was building those networks up. That allowed me to get the job. When I got the job, I read. I went and talked to people. I read lots of articles. I talked to loads of people in the industry, got loads of information, and then got my knowledge wider and wider and wider. Um, and then as part of that, and very close to that is you got to network with people. Go and meet mm -hmm. people, network with them, keep to know them on a regular basis. Um, so those are the things that sort of happen, the key things for me. I think in summary, I would say get your education, uh, build up your CV in terms of volunteering or internship or paid work uh, and make it as wide as possible. Uh, look out for those jobs in sport. Network, network, network and read, read, read. Read about lots of information, lots of, um, in, you know, in those sports business, mm. online publications. Um, and yeah, listen out for podcasts and blogs and, and write that, write those as well. Make sure you get yourself known uh, by writing, right. blog, writing about what you, what you enjoy. But for me, the sports industry is amazing and I love it. I, I love getting up every morning and that's important. That's important for me. Love it. Um, and it's difficult out there, especially with the pandemic, with lack of events. But if I can do it, anybody can do it. Yeah. You said that in our last class. If, that, if you really, if I think if anyone can do it, we can all do it. Honestly, it's just, it seems like a great industry. I've just got it, just been kind of getting my foot in the door on it. Um, and you also talked about, you know, kind of getting your name out there. I've been doing this podcast now. I've, I think you're my fifth person I've interviewed and I'm going to be putting that on there. So it's been great. Um, Jeff, uh, thank you. Oh, by the way, also, um, one other thing, uh, we've, we've been preaching networking a lot. Um, and, but something new you brought up was kind of reading and I've kind of, I appreciate that. It's, that was, that is something that I haven't heard yet from everyone else that I've talked to. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. And, you know, I would say to people, you know, check out sports pro media, mm. check out sports Uh, You know, these are just two areas, but you will find out sports biz news uh, and go and register for to receive their, their, their daily or weekly emails and read, 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 build up the knowledge, network, 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 meet people, build up your CV, be more marketable by having what you have on your CV and, and, and really try and drive into new projects um, and, and, and just have that can-do attitude. All right. I will be doing that. Jeff, thank you for coming. And I'm so glad I got to do this. This has been amazing. You're very welcome. Keep up the good work, uh, Alex, and uh, all the best for studies. Yep. Thank you. You have a good day and I'll uh, talk to you later. Good day.